Our scripture reading tonight is Nehemiah 2, 4 through 5. Then the, ki then the king said to him, what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, if it please the king and your servants have found favor in your, in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's stone, that I might rebuild it. Please turn your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. Before we get into Nehemiah, let me correct a misunderstanding from this morning. Um, I have decided that I'm not going to beg anymore. Uh, if you want to go to building bridges, I hope you do. Because I believe building bridges will give you the tools that you need to reach your five. But I don't think I need to keep on begging. If you really love your five, you want them to be converted, you want them to be faithful, I believe you'll go to class. So quit doing that. I'm not going to quit talking about prayer. Because prayer is something we're doing, talking about all this year. Because we are in the midst of a campaign that will take us through December. Pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. I'm also not going to stop talking about your five because every one of us have people that we love who are not faithful Christians. And if they don't repent, if they don't convert to Jesus and his church, become a member of the Lord's church, then they're going to spend eternity in hell. And I know for my five, I don't want any of my five to spend eternity in hell. So I'm going to keep on talking about my five because that is so important. But tonight, tonight I want us to go to the kingdom of Persia. At this time, around 445 B.C., the kingdom of Persia was perhaps the greatest and most powerful kingdom on the earth. And we're going to look at a man a man named Nehemiah. Nehemiah served in a very important role in that kingdom. He was the cupbearer to the king, Artaxerxes. And being the cupbearer, he made sure that the king was not assassinated with a poison. He would first sample, make sure everything was okay. At this time... In Nehemiah chapter 1, the Jewish people had returned to the promised land. As predicted by the prophet Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 29, the Babylonian captivity lasted 70 years. And by Nehemiah chapter 1, there had already been two waves of refugees returning to the promised land. In fact, 70 years has elapsed since the first group of Jewish people returned to Jerusalem. And there's a big problem. They're back in the land, but nothing had been done to restore the walls of the city. In that day and time, the wall around a city stood for security. Because if a city had walls, they could protect the citizens of the city against bandits, against marauders. But see, the great city of Jerusalem did not have a wall. The walls that had been destroyed by the Babylonians were still destroyed. In Nehemiah, in Nehemiah chapter 1, he gets a report. And things... Things are kind of bleak because the people living there in Jerusalem live in fear of being attacked. So what could he do? He is living in one of the capital cities of the Persian Empire. What could Nehemiah do? He did exactly what you and I can do when we talk about our five. He prayed. Not just one time. Not just two times. He prayed for about four months. 
because he had a heart for his people. When sharing Jesus with your five, don't just bear witness, intercede in prayers too. We need to pray about our five. I call these brief prayers heavenly telegrams. If you don't know anything about telegrams, telegrams are always very brief, very short, because you get charged for the number of words in the telegram. So you want it to be very brief. You know, there is a time and place for us to pray from the heart. You know, prayers that come deep inside and are detailed and, and lengthy. And those are good prayers. But there's also time for us to pray, I call them these short prayers, heavenly telegrams that we can offer up to God at any moment's notice. We should send heavenly telegrams because they keep us in continuous fellowship with God. Nehemiah, Nehemiah had a big task because he had to work to rebuild the wall. He had to work with one hand and he had to fight off enemies with the other hand. How was that possible? Prayer. Prayer made that possible. The walls, the walls were rebuilt in 52 days. That's amazing. To rebuild a wall in 52 days. I wish Nehemiah could come and help us with our Arkansas highways. You know, don't you, you know? Get those highways fixed. Prayer. Prayer made everything possible for Nehemiah. This year, we want to pray like we never have before. Pray without ceasing. And that is possible by what? Heavenly telegrams. We're going to be praying long prayers, yes. But we're going to be praying a lot of short prayers, I believe. Heavenly telegrams are effective. Nehemiah's heavenly telegram was answered with more than he could have imagined. Let's look. Let's look first at his long prayer. Then we're going to look at the short prayer. First, the long prayer. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 5. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O oh, great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, night and day. Constant prayer, heartfelt prayer, deep prayer. For the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. This prayer continues here in chapter 1. He's praying. These were one of those long, lengthy, detailed, straight-from-the-heart prayers. But now go with me to Nehemiah chapter 2. Verse number four, then the king said to me, what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Stop right there. Was this going to be a long prayer? No. This was going to be one of those heavenly telegrams. Because the king asked, hey, what's wrong? What do you request? Verse five, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king... And if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tomb, that I may rebuild it. Chapter 1, long, detailed, heartfelt prayer. Chapter 2, spur of the moment, he says a prayer. Before he answers the king, he has a silent prayer to God. This is one of those heavenly telegrams. And his heavenly telegram was answered with more than he could imagine. He's only asking to go back to the city. He ends up going back with supplies, with materials, with letters, and with escorts, and with money. 
that was more than he even was asking the king to provide. This heavenly telegram was answered. This morning we looked at the story of that Pharisee and the tax collector who went to the temple to pray. And the Pharisee, he has this long prayer that focuses it on him, that puts all the glory to him, puts the spotlight on him. That tax collector only says seven words. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he was forgiven. That's a heavenly telegram. thief on the cross, his request to Jesus in the Greek language is only nine words long. Remember the response from Jesus? Today you will be with me in paradise. Brief prayers are still powerful prayers. Because, why? Because of the one who answers prayers. It's because of God. God makes it possible. Heavenly telegrams help to prevent putting the spotlight on us. You offer up heavenly telegrams when you are experiencing a great need. And that takes a spotlight from you and puts a spotlight on the one who could answer those prayers. Jesus warned us not to place our prayers on parade. Matthew chapter 6. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their rewards. Heavenly telegrams serve as an antidote to Satan's poison. We need to be in close, continuous fellowship with God. Heavenly telegrams help us to do that. Because Satan is always trying to derail us. He's always trying to bring us down. Ephesians chapter 6. Above all, take in the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. You see, Satan is going to constantly be trying. But when we are in that continual fellowship with God. We have the strength to resist. Yes, to resist even the devil. So a question to you. When should we send God heavenly telegrams? Answer, anytime. God loves to hear from us anytime. But especially when we want to thank God. We were in the car coming back from visiting Loreen. And Lisa made mention about how pretty the day was. At that moment, silently I said, God, thank you for giving us such a beautiful day. I wanted to thank God for what he was doing for us. You want to send up those heavenly telegrams when danger is near. That's what Nehemiah did. Nehemiah chapter 4. And all of them conspired to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God. Danger was on the horizon for Nehemiah and his workers. But we prayed to God, and because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. In Matthew chapter 8, Jesus and the disciples are in a boat. It's late, Jesus is asleep, and a storm comes up. What do the disciples do? They send a heavenly telegram, Lord, save us. And Jesus calmed the storm on the sea. In Matthew chapter 14, Peter is walking on the sea. And he can walk because he's looking at Jesus. But the moment he takes his eyes off for the Lord, he looks at the water and the wind and the waves. He starts to sink and he says, Lord, save me. A little short, heavenly telegrams work. 
We need heavenly telegrams when we are discouraged. Once again, Nehemiah chapter 4. four. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. People are against us. The enemy is out there. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to a land of captivity. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 9. For they, for they all were trying to make us afraid. All the enemies were trying to discourage us, to make us afraid, saying their hands will be weakened in the work and it will not be done. Nehemiah realized that the hope of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem was in jeopardy. Their hope could sink because of the threat of opposition. So my question to you and me is this. What threatens to sink you? What brings you down? What is discouraging you? What do you need to talk to God, both in detailed prayers, which are usually long and lengthy, and what do you need to talk to Him about in just little, short, heavenly telegrams. You see, prayer is not just what we do in the morning and at lunchtime and supper and bedtime. Prayer is something we can do any time of the day. When chaos reigns. In Nehemiah chapter 13, what's happening here? Well, let's look. Nehemiah chapter 13 We've got the son of the high priest, and he is what? He is part of the family of the enemy of God's people. Verse 29, remember them, O my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. You know, the world we live in today is no longer Andy Griffiths, Mayberry, RFD. It's no longer Ozzy and Harriet. We live in a world that is filled with things which I don't even come even remotely interested in because it's evil. Chaos is out there. I need to know that I can go to my God at any time both in long, detailed prayers and short, little, heavenly telegrams. And he listens. Exodus 14, God's people are facing a problem. They've got the Red Sea in front of them. They've got Pharaoh's army behind them. And what does God say to Moses? And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. They're going to, of course, walk on dry land through the Red Sea. But here's my question. Look at Exodus 14. Where do you have Moses praying? Where do you have Moses crying out to God? This is probably one of those little short heavenly telegrams again. Moses, God, I need your help. We're in a tight place here. God, I need you to rescue us. And God did. So what? You know, I like to end lessons as often as I can with a so what. I want to give you something that's practical that will help you to apply the lesson into your life. Here's the first part. Practice. Practice sending God your own heavenly telegrams. It could be just a few words, but you're talking to God. You're talking to one who can make a difference. Practice sending your own heavenly telegrams. And number two, don't limit your prayer life to heavenly telegrams. Yes, you heard me right. We need the long, detailed, deep from the heart prayers, but there's time. We just need to real quickly just say a prayer to God and he will listen to both, both the long ones and the short ones. 
Don't limit your prayer life just to heavenly telegrams. Do both. I like to say this. Heavenly telegrams are like between meal snacks. You know, you have in, the, in between meal snacks, you know, maybe a little pretzel or a little chip or maybe an apple or whatever. Do you want to live on those in between meal snacks? No. I look forward to big meals. I want my big meal. But there are times when I just want a little taste of something. That's what heavenly telegrams do for us. Between the big prayers, there are times we need the little prayers also. If you're not a Christian, let me urge you to make those steps right now so you can become a Christian, to believe, repent, confess, and to be baptized. As a Christian, as a Christian, can people tell that you are a Christian? It should be obvious that people can tell that you're a Christian in school, at work, in your community. Hey, that's a Christian. If your life is not a advertisement for Jesus, if people can't see the reason why you love the Lord, you can seek forgiveness and he will forgive, 1 John 1, 9. The church here wants to pray with you and for you. Clayton has selected a song to encourage you. I pray that it will encourage you to take whatever steps you need as we stand and sing for your encouragement. Hear the-